Uh, other people would make fun of me right now. Wait, what are the lasers for? You guys, this is ridiculous. There are lasers shooting out of my head. I'm sorry, am I in, in your way? I can scoot back here. No, you're okay. All right. That's a nice. That's a nice hoodie. I have that same hoodie. Very cool. Wow, this is coming along nicely. Look at that. Hello, my name is Luke, and I became a little bit obsessed with these things. These are a whole bunch of shipping containers. This is in Mombasa, Kenya. Um, they're also called TEUs. I didn't. It's not fully mobile yet, so I wasn't able to bring the whole container, but there are <laughs> chunks from the side where I cut out some of the windows. TEU is short for 20-foot equivalent unit. Pretty much everything that you buy or see either got here on one of these or leaves here, mainly got here on one of these, sometimes leaves here on one of them. There's a big surplus of them in the U.S. We're a net importer. Um, they're 20 feet by 8 feet by 8 and a half tall. That size is interesting because within Austin city limits, like my yard about a mile from here, you are not allowed to build something above 200 square feet without a permit from the city. 20 times eight is 160, so in theory you can build, it's called like a storage structure or something, so you basically have to <coughs> pretend you don't live in it, and you can build one of these. Your neighbor can call code enforcement every day about you, and in theory you have no issue. It was <laughs> <laughs> in theory, it's an ongoing debate with my neighbor. <laughs> so no fire, it's no still there, yeah. so that says something. Um, it's not light, it weighs about 5,000 pounds. This is, I think this is 18 gauge corrugated, so it's, it's heavy, but it's also easy to weld onto, not so easy to cut. Um, you can get them cheap if you just want to call somewhere and have it show up like within a week. It's going to be like 3,000 to 3,500. There's a company called Falcon that has one that's in really good shape near here. If you look on Craigslist for terms like Connex, one of the industry terms for it, or eBay for that, there's a lot fewer people searching for them and a lot more people posting for them. So I was able to wait a while and find one delivered for $1,300, um, which I was pretty happy with. So my design criteria were that it's <laughs> portable. I wanted it, there's tons, if you search for shipping container house, you'll find thousands of projects that use multiple containers, and they basically wasted a bunch of money by buying metal as a container instead of as a sheet. They cut them in half and they're linking them together and otherwise, you know, getting rid of the whole shipping part of the container. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't do that. I took about a year before I decided I was going to cut windows in this. Originally I wanted to keep it so that I could ship it overseas. With windows I think I lose that shipability, <laughs> but I should still be able to put it, you know, on a truck and move it to, to wherever on this continent. Off-grid, at least off-grid capable, meaning that water in via rain waste out um, food and electricity. I wanted to at least have the design plan for how I can grow it so that I can take care of those things myself. I wanted it to be sexy. I have a very Blade Runner metal post-apocalyptic idea of sexy. So <laughs> um, I wanted it to be cheap. This has to be something that's not, you know, another masturbatory design exercise that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, my cost in parts, when if I ever finish it, should be in the neighborhood of 10,000, which would mean that, you know, something that you can go out and buy for cheaper than you would an equivalent trailer or something else that doesn't look as cool. Um, and so here, if the YouTubes are working, is the basic plan I came up with for it. This is the eventual, this is obviously not what it looks like yet. The idea is that the roof is sized and attached such that I, it just bolts on like a grid beam style, and then the individual components fit within the container to later relocate it. Likewise with the spiral staircase. So yeah, I still have a bit of distance to go until I hit <coughs> something like that, but that's the eventual idea. Um, turns out midway through this project, uh, I started working for a friend of mine 
at his startup, which is making biochar kilns. And long story short, he started asking me a lot of questions about plasma CNCs, which I'm passionate about and have a little bit of experience in, and whether he'd be able to make a metal working shop out of a shipping container and just kind of ship it over to Kenya, where one of his steel projects is. So now this became two shipping container projects. I became very happy and I started spending some of my time in Kenya. So this is the layout for the planned shipping container over in Kenya. It is currently held up, hopefully it's not in that stack I showed you at the start, but it's in, that <laughs> <laughs> it's in that same town, in Mombasa, Kenya, and in theory, it will clear customs this month. So in the US, it was pretty easy. This is the guy's track. This is my yard with my junk all over it. Um, <laughs> this is a 40-foot truck backing into my driveway. He <laughs> actually hit the container, like this part of it as he was backing in, hit into the rafter of my house, and like some of my housemates said, it shook the whole house. It seemed like the roof was bumped a little differently afterwards, but <laughs> other than that, there was some sweat involved, this poor stuff of a tree. This is at come along rated for like two tons, and I've guesstimated that that might work and not break in my face, and it didn't break in my face. It did eventually help pull the container off, and for about six months, I had a container just sitting on the ground like that which was a start. I finally had a container. On the Kenya side, the, con the Kenya side happens about a year and a half after the other side. They're interspersed. Um, this is load one of shop equipment for the Kenya bound container. This is a four foot by four foot plasma CNC. It ended up being a lot of shop equipment and a lot of bicycles. There's a unicycle in there somewhere and other things that I wanted to have if I'm going to be spending any amount of time in Kenya and wasn't sure I'd be able to get there. So this is it right before we sealed it and sent it from Houston. Um, shipping a container, kind of everyone will tell you and you won't, you probably won't believe just like I didn't, that it's hard and takes a lot of money and time. It's really hard. It takes a ton of money. It makes no logical sense and it takes like three months plus. It might be different if you send it to Europe or something. It's definitely easier if it's just like on a truck within the U.S but we'll end up spending, including purchase of the container, about 10 to 12 grand total, and it'll take three, hopefully three to four, maybe a little longer months from packing it in Houston till it is in our town in rural Kenya and fully in our possession. So it's a pain. It doesn't really seem to be anything you can do to speed it up, so if you try it. One of the things that surprised you doing that, why is it a pain? Um, things just take forever. Like. <laughs> Every aspect of it takes forever. There are more, you know, coming from a tech background, there are more acronyms than <laughs> I would have ever imagined. <laughs> Nobody explains them. They're not even indexed online at all. <laughs> at least with technology, you can Wikipedia it or something. But it, yeah, it, I mean, weird things, too. Like, there was a two and a half week delay because the port was backed up. Mombasa is, like, the biggest, it's the place in eastern Africa where the fiber hits the land, like the optical fiber. So it's a pretty important town. You'd think that they would size the port somewhat the right size to receive the number of containers coming in, but apparently they're off by three weeks occasionally. Just weird things like that added up. Um, so back to the US side, I needed something to set this container on. This is a, it's like a $60 pole called a tractor jack or trailer jack from good old Harbor Freight. That one bent in half after about <laughs> 10 minutes of attempted use. That is the same thing. That's a four foot, this black thing is four feet long. And the ground was wet, and I hadn't realized I had to put down like some kind of footer for it. So it's, it's four feet, or three and a half feet deep in the ground that time. This is, that ended up hitting me in the head. <laughs> but eventually we got it to look like this, which is more level than it appears. <laughs> Safer than it appears? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about safer. I mean, it fell a lot when I was jacking it up, but it hasn't fallen from this configuration yet. <laughs> so basically, it's sitting directly on the ground, or I think there's like one brick back there. And then, what is cool, I mean, you can make it look less like crap than this, obviously. But because this is structural steel all along here, it's, it's strong enough that you only have to support the four corners. So you don't have to do a traditional foundation, you can just do piers four piers rather than the 30 or whatever a house would normally sit on. In Kenya, it's a little easier. We paid someone about $600, and they're going to do this style of job. <coughs> um, we're just going to do it the exact si size of the container, so that'll be nice and simple. You don't get under foundation storage, but it's a lot easier. <laughs> 
to the walls. In Kenya, that was easy. It's between 65 and 80 degrees all the time. I don't need insulation. I might put a little shade roof over it just to keep the metal from degrading in the rain, and I might paint the outside occasionally. But other than that, you know, walls in Kenya are done. In the U.S., I wanted to do some kind of insulation. I found this wacky stuff online. It's called Prodex. It's basically the stuff you put. You can pass this around or pull off a chunk if you want. Um, <laughs> It's basically like the stuff you put on your car windshield. In theory, it's supposed to be a layer of closed cells in between two reflective layers. So I figured my main concern here would be dealing with heat. And it's called what? Protex? Prodex? Prodex. What's the R value on that? They claim something ridiculous. Like they claim 15 or something and then give you a big explanation of why they don't think R value makes sense. Um, <laughs> I couldn't decide between the pink stuff, which, you know, just the Home Depot normal fiberglass insulation, and this ceramic paint. So I went for the middle, like the only half magic bean sounding things. The ceramic paint just sounded too ridiculous. So it seems to make a difference. I haven't, and I won't bother doing any R value testing or anything on it, but it seems to be helping a little bit. Um, I didn't want to lose as much space as I'd have to with doing a sufficient amount of the fiberglass stuff as well. So those are two by fours. They're laid flat against most of the wall, um, meaning I'm only losing that like inch and a half. And then I cover covered it as a later step with particle board and painted that. This is kind of what it looks like <coughs> close up. It will be a little more finished looking eventually. But basically what you have is the metal shell outside. This will be covered is partially covered now with a layer of roof paint, just on the whole container. It's like high reflectivity value. You have this, you have some air openings because of the perforation of this, and then you have the reflective-ish layer, and then the particle board. So that's the idea for the wall. The ceiling, similar deal, eight and a half feet tall, so I didn't mind losing the four inches there. And then windows. I borrowed a friend's plasma cutter, rigged together an extension cord that was of course, fully up to code. <laughs> and <laughs> these are actually, actually, this is a picture of where I cut these two holes, these two windows out. If anybody wants a chunk of shipping container, feel free to grab it. I ended up doing three different styles of windows just based on what scrap ones I had left over and wanted to experiment with it. These are two layers of boards, I think like inch and a half boards I used, and then two layers of plexiglass just cuts to the size of the opening. So it's basically a double pane improvised window. This is a detail on a French door flipped 90 degrees to make like a long window. I realized, I stayed in those trailers out in Marfa, El Cosmico, I think it's called, and realized that like the Airstreams and the other trailers that people think look and feel good to stay in all have a long window along one side so that you kind of lose the sense of how narrow the space is. So I figured I could do that with this door, obviously decaying in my yard. And these are sheet metal, these are self-tapping metal screws just through the frame, the wood frame of the door, and then they actually go right through the container to the outside. I just put like 12 of those around in it. It seems to be holding so far. Um, and then I just did great stuff. I might make it look a little nicer later on to seal the gap from the corrugation of the outside. And that's the window system. This is more or less what it looks like right now. I'll eventually do something with the floor. I think I'm just gonna do vinyl on top of that if you pay for a nicer container. It's some wacky kind of wood. It's like pressure treated and then insect and fire resistant some, with some wacky chemical or something, but it seemed like it could be refinished. Mine had a few too many dents in it, so I'm just gonna do vinyl on top of it. The grid-free part has a lot of work <laughs> left to do. Um, basically, I'm gonna just make like slight, mainly Arduino or simpler based automations to a bunch of <laughs> traditional systems. Like I think one of the problems with solar ovens, for example, is you don't have any way to open it when your food's cooked or alert you when your food's done cooking. Like you kind of have to hang out at your house all day for a lot of these appropriate technologies to work right. I think there's, I have planned cheap modifications to them that you know might make it work a little better with modern life. So I have a lot left to do there, but that's the plan. Um, the factory <laughs> capabilities, this is basically what it has. It's kind of like a dream shop. It's hey, really, in theory, if it ever gets out of customs, it'll be really fun to work in. <laughs> um, in, to in terms of tools to expand, what I mean by that is it will contain, or we will obtain, everything we need to basically build a superstructure around it. So instead of having a 160 square foot workshop, 
we have you know, almost five times, as over five times as much as that. We have an area on top, we have spaces on both sides, and we have a front area all secured. There's gonna be CEB style and probably going to use the open source ecology press, the automated brick press, to use soil that we have on site at our farm there to basically build a superstructure around it where we have a lot more space than, you know, than the 160 square feet that we take over. Why was the shipping container an advantage to send to Canada? I mean, so the big thing, there. one of the big, weird big things that I've recently discovered in the <coughs> strange world of international shipping is your cost does not go up linearly to send the plasma table alone, which was key to our current design for the kiln. We basically cut the lid for a 55 gallon drum out of that. You can't obtain it in Kenya. There's like three in the whole country. Um, and to send that just via DHL as a part of the container, that would have cost at least four or five grand. So, you know, we get like 20 times as much space. We were able to send over like the TIG welder that we wanted that would be very difficult. And there'd be a premium on the price to obtain it there. Basically, it's sending a 20 foot equivalent unit is how shipping is optimized. So if you if somebody's breaking that and you're doing part of it, you're gonna pay a substantial, substantial penalty. Um, and it's even more of a pain in the ass, which is hard to imagine considering the, <laughs> the process so far. Um, deployments, basically the idea with the factory is that we make this a fab lab in a box that comes with a business plan. So we're able to roll these out minimize our carbon footprint on creating these things by deploying them where they're going to be used. And then, you know, we come up with new ideas from wherever we're working, we roll them out to the other shops. But more often than not, the shops, the local staff running the shops partnered with us, come up with ideas that work in Kenya and, you know, we can deploy it like software rather than like hardware. Instead of continuing to read articles from Mother Earth News from 40 years ago and marveling at the stuff that was in Whole Earth Catalog, we can not lose all that information because people aren't sharing enough and rapidly enough. We can start to treat hardware how it should be treated, which is exactly like software. There should be no difference as far as I'm concerned. Maybe it takes a day rather than a few minutes to, to download and understand the plans. But other than that, for good design, it should be just as extensible and just as deployable. So our goal is to have three of these sites deployed. Kenya will be the first, obviously, in 2012. And on deployment on the container house side, I plan to move into it this year. So yeah, that's about it. Um, we are hiring, it's a paid thing in Kenya, and you have access to like a crazy shipping container based shop. <laughs> <laughs> and a bicycle. And a unicycle and a bicycle. <laughs> so yeah, um, thanks. If you guys have any questions, or want um, to see a I'd chunk of the container. I'd, at first I wondered why you would ship it from here, and I thought, wow, $1,300. But then in looking at all the costs, I'm from South Africa, and the uh, there's a huge market for, for containers and both Cape Town and Durban have mm -hmm. massive ports with millions of, of, of these uh, disused containers. Um, so I thought, well, probably for your next ones, perhaps you might consider bringing them from South Africa because they will absolutely be cheaper. You um, know, I thought they'd be a lot cheaper. We priced some in Kenya at a few different ports and a used container there was almost Exactly. Surprise! I thought they'd be a lot cheaper. They were almost exactly the same price. The, the reason that they may be cheaper is because there's a the, because the ports are, uh, the use of them in Durban and, and Cape Town is exponentially larger. Yeah. And in fact, there's a market and and there's been lots of alternative uses of the of these containers and these for NGOs and all kinds of uses. Also, secondly, if you're setting up a business from here in Kenya. You may qualify under Algoa, which is a which is a, uh, a program that the U.S. runs that that uh, relaxes or actually waives certain import duties and taxes and things of that nature. So you might check that cool. out. Well. Yeah, we were we talked to a lot of developing countries have something that basically they have like a one-stop shop to try to make it easier for foreign investment. So we we're part of what's taking so long with the containers that we're getting a waiver on like 80 percent of the tax. The unicycle, actually, the government official who's running their one-stop <laughs> shop and we're in contact with specifically pointed out the unicycle as a reason why it was getting delayed to get the cat <laughs> <laughs> I need to learn how to ride that thing and really get a lot of fun out of it for the problems that it's caused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How are you powering the shop? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, shop in Kenya ha will have grid power connected to it. It is, as you would expect, not reliable and not a clear power source. I'm debating, my thought right now is that, you know, obviously computers, the CNC, all of that will be behind a, it's called power scrubber. Basically, it just like cleans up the connection. We also have a generator that will let us run the table, a couple of computers, and a few other tools. Um, my big theme with the initial equipment, because we don't, I don't know exactly what I want to deploy. This is my first time building a shipping container based metal shop in a third world country. So I basically brought a bunch of, like, my main theme was to make it as robust as I could via redundancy and alternatives. So we have like four welding processes instead of one. We have an oxy setup, we have pig, we have arc, we have mig, so that, you know, we're going to find out what works with this and then kind of have a much more trimmed down inventory for the next one. Is it difficult to get things like tunables, like welding wire, things like that? Um, there, it's, it's really surprising what's difficult to get. Like every time I try to source something, I cannot for the life of me find high temperature paint that is less than $50 per liter. In the US, it's like $5 per liter. Um, welding consumables, you can find Nairobi, like the capital has you know, plasma consumables, all that stuff. It's cool because the little bit of difficulty with finding that will help us kind of optimize what we decide to build ourselves. So like, I mean, I hate that in the US, how expensive plasma consumables are. Plasma cutter is like the cheapest, in theory, way to cut large quantities of different shapes, like it makes a cut like this, it's a lot cheaper than oxyacetylene, but it's like five bucks every time you, five bucks plus every time you wear out a tip, which, you know, if you're running a table all day, you'll go through like five tips. It's a little piece of copper like that big, so that's on my list of things to try to make eventually. What do you expect to manufacture from the shop? So our first product is a kiln to make biochar. Biochar is a soil amendment that reduces one's need for fertilizer, increases, changes the soil in some like unfully documented ways. They think it affects cation exchange capacity, like the ability to uptake nutrients and some other stuff. Um, basically, we're making them and selling them for less than farmers spend on fertilizer for a year, and they're able to make enough to cut their fertilizer use at least in half. So it's like a two year max payback. <laughs> and then we'll do other, our focus is carbon negative or carbon neutral solutions that are you know, affordable, for everyone, but cool enough that people want to buy them in, you know, not just the third world, but the first as well. Cool, thanks. Well, thank you.